Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Alison Jane Reed. I've been a journalist for over 20 years on national newspapers. And uh, I love to interview icons and people in the public eye, and I enjoy drawing them out. And this afternoon, my interview guest is John Simpson, CBE, the BBC World Affairs editor, buccaneering foreign correspondent, author and global traveller. Welcome, John. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice to, of you to invite me. Uh, I, I think, first of all, what, what I would like to say is that I, I certainly was inspired by you to become a journalist after to watching you uh, when I was a student at university and certainly in the 90s when you were reporting from some of the most dangerous places on earth, including Afghanistan and the Gulf and Serbia. But I knew very quickly that I would make a lousy foreign correspondent. I wanted to be a, a feature writer, but I didn't want your job. How on earth do you do it? And how do you retain this sense of joy and fun that you clearly have after, in, after you know, oh, being a man with more than nine lives, I'd say you've got 900 lives. You've been in some very dangerous <laughs> situations. I've, I've, I enjoy myself, uh, to be honest. Um, I, I just think that's what you ought to, to do. And I, there's a, I also do have a, a kind of um, a purpose in, in what I do. It's not, it's not a very elaborate one. Um, in fact, it's more of a sort of an attitude, I suppose, really more than anything else. But I, I just don't like things to be, to lie covered up. I, I, I just feel that, you know, we all ought to know just about everything, everything that's, that's reasonable for us to know. And, um, so I've had a lifetime of uh, being paid to go around and not always being paid, actually, but um, to go around and dig things up and show people what's really happening in their world. And so it's a pleasure. You know, it's not a uh, uh, it's not a kind of fierce duty. Uh, it's not something I do to get rid of of uh, the kind of, um, you know, dragons in my own life. It's something that I really, really enjoy doing. So no, not surprisingly, it, it's, a, it's a pleasure. Were you, a, were you a curious child? I mean, did, did you know very early on that you wanted to have a career in journalism and as a writer? I mean, I know that you edited Granter at, at Cambridge. Was the instinct there? To, to become a journalist from, a, from an early age? And, and was that born out of being inquisitive? Yes, I, th I think it was. Um, at school, I, I, I went to a, a, a school which had a monumental, vast, great, late Victorian red brick building. Now, very sadly, I think, knocked down, has been for decades. Um, and I, I used... That. It was St Paul's in London, in Hammersmith. And um, I used to uh, search around this extraordinary building and uh, climbing up uh, around the rooftops of it and, uh, and so on. And I got, I was constantly being caught and constantly being punished for that. And I was, the, you know, in those days, they used to the give me the cane and... You were climbing on the roof. What? You were climbing on the rooftops of yeah, the, yeah. the full school. Yeah, yeah. No, it was fascinating. And uh, there were uh, very, very steep um, roofs and um, with with um, ancient kind of ladders up and down them. And uh, yeah. no, so I love doing all of that and finding great... It sounds like you didn't have any sense of fear because like, you wouldn't catch me doing that. I'm afraid... <laughs> um, well, I, I kind of, uh, no, I don't, I don't like heights very much, but it, 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 it was just something I wanted to, to do and I wanted to explore it. And then uh, I got caught loads of times and, and uh, you know, in those days they used to cane you. So I was, for a time, I was the most caned kid in the school. Um, 
but uh, it, it, I, I loved doing it. And, and then I became, um, also I became the editor of the school newspaper. So I started to realize that I did uh, want to write about things. And if you want to write about things, you've got to have experiences to write about. And so I suppose that's really how it all started. So, so it wasn't necessarily that you were going to go into journalism at this point. You didn't know that uh, when you were at school that you wanted to be a journalist. No, I didn't. I and uh, I think if I'd about. said that, yeah, I think if I'd said that to my father, I think he'd have tried to persuade me not to do it um, at all, you know, because... I, the, there's something slightly dodgy about journalists, isn't there? And and it doesn't matter how grand you are, um, there's still something sort of slightly I'm as sorry. of, you know, using fake IDs to get into places and go around the back where you're not supposed to go around. And believe me, I mean, I, I know some very grand journalists nowadays and they're all the same. I mean, they'd still do it. And hopping over police lines where you're not supposed to and telling lies to the cop on the, you know, that's something that the, the I dare say the editor of the times and the, the, um, and the guardian would still, would still do. Now, just talking about, about your father, I, I know that you, uh, when your parents um, separated and, and divorced, you quite unusually chose to live with your dad which was certainly unusual for the times in the, in the 50s. And you've said that you adored your dad. What was he like? And what was your childhood like growing up in the... Well, my childhood was slightly weird as a result of all that. Um, and my dad was, was uh, he was a real, real kind of eccentric, um, genuine, you know. Some people put on eccentricities and, and like to seem eccentric. My father was genuinely eccentric. I mean, I remember he um, once, uh, and this was still in the 50s, when people were so sort of buttoned up and, and so on, he bought um, a, a whole box full of, of uh, reading glasses in some junk shop, big box, and he went through them, trying them on. I remember sitting there and um, finally, he found one that, that fitted him. And, and I, I said to him, I don't think, and he said, oh, for God's sake, you know, I, I, these are fine. And he walked out and then he caught sight of himself in, a, in a, a mirror somewhere, in a window, shop window or something. And they were those kind of Dame Ebna, average sort <laughs> of diamante oh my things, um, he must have which he looked ridiculous. really, ridiculous. sorry? He must have looked quite right? ridiculous. Yeah, the... well, loony, yes, yeah, <laughs> definitely loony. Um, and he did, you know, that was how that was how he was. And we had a very, um, a really very happy time. I, I, he, he, you know, I mean, he was quite bad tempered sometimes, but most of the time he was he was wonderful. And he he was the one. He when he was fifteen, I think, or sixteen, or something, he ran away to sea. Um, and he became a steward uh, at the age of 16 on a piano uh, liner that used to go to um, Australia via uh, the Suez Canal, which we're hearing a lot about at the moment, and uh, India. And um, he used to say to me, you know, God, this country is so provincial. Nobody knows what lies outside the shores of, of Britain. And uh, I can't bear it. And so he was always sort of going on to people about, about foreign affairs. So I learned that right. my, my trade really from him. So did that, did that inspire and captivate you? I mean, I, I had uh, uh, my mother's um, brother who was illegitimate and was a scandal in our family. He ran away to sea. It sounds so exciting. I mean, when did you last hear someone say they ran away to sea? You just don't hear it anymore. It, it you know, suggests this exciting romanticism that I think is, is vanishing, that people are not so prepared to, to take a risk and just take off. Well, I mean, I can't say I took huge numbers of risks in my the earliest part of my, my career. I mean, I had the kind of background now that 
people want to cover up and hide. You know, I went to a private school, I went to Cambridge, and I went straight to the BBC, and I've stuck there ever since. So you could a say, like I mean, a bit like Attenborough. I know he's yeah, a bit. Than you and I, I know you're occasionally mistaken for Attenborough. <laughs> It always yeah. irritates me because he's 20 years older than me. Right, right, too. <laughs> but you've both had very, very long careers. So you, you joined the BBC. I think he joined radio after being turned down for television. For yeah, years. that's right. Well, they were, their judgments are always wonderful, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, did, you know, did your father give you a sense of, of wonder about the world? Do you think that inspired you to, to um, take up this extraordinary life, as you, you described to me as a buccaneer journalist, which is a, a career that is vanishing that you can't really do now because of health and safety. I mean, some of the scrapes and escapades you've got into wouldn't be allowed anymore, would they, because of the risk? Well, they wouldn't if, if, if the, somebody can stop you. Uh, the, I think the answer is really to, make sure that you're not stopped. It is difficult nowadays. I mean, it really is very hard. Only about 20 years ago, you could still head off. I'm talking really about the BBC, but I think it's absolutely general. Uh, you could just head off and do pretty much what you wanted, wherever you wanted to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, you'd, you'd sort of get in touch every every few days and say, I'm still here, or I'm thinking of going there, and so on. Again, carefully edited, even in those days, in case they tried to, to stop you. Um, but now, the, you know, the money is so tight, and this isn't just the BBC, uh, it's, every, it's throughout journalism, that they want to know exactly where you're going, and they want to make sure you don't spend too much of your money hanging around. And so after three days, four days, you just go on a plane again and come home. And it, I, I do, I've got a friend called Anthony Lloyd who works for The Times, uh, and they, they give him the scope to just wander around and find stories, mostly in Afghanistan and Syria and, and uh, Iraq. And he comes up with the most fantastic stories that win prizes and everybody tries to emulate and, and follow up. Um, and, but no, none of these organizations <laughs> seem to draw the conclusion that actually the way to find things out is to go and look for them. Um, you know, what can you do? I'm, I'm really glad I'm not starting off now because I, I think I'd have a much more regimented kind of life. Yeah, so are you still able to go out and do exactly what you want to do, John? I mean, no, I wish I were. Not in the. Did it give you a lot of scope? No, no scope at all, really. And I mean, in the last, in the last year, ever since COVID uh, came along, um, there's always been that that kind of sense that. Uh, you know, I'm ancient, uh, I could catch it and die at any moment. And then who knows, you know, the, the Daily Mail might run a story saying, why did the BBC allow this broken down old bastard to go to wherever it might be? I was almost, I almost went with the Pope to Iraq the other day, whenever it was, just the, earlier this month. Um, but at the last moment, uh, it was clear that I wasn't going to get my second COVID jab in time. And so somebody else did it. But How frustrating. I, I bet you, you must have felt really, really frustrated by that. Oh, no, I was glad in a way. I mean, I was sorry not to go back to Iraq because I haven't been there now for three years, I think, two, two years, three years. But... Um, no, th those things where you follow some um, famous character, some uh, elevated character around, uh, they're always absolutely awful. And you're I agree stuck. with you. you. You don't want something that's orchestrated, as you say. You want to go off and find the story. And I think yeah. that, that's something that come acro comes across in your autobiography, um, It's a Mad World, My Masters, that the stories that you stumbled across and or where you encountered someone and then you were off in in 
pursuit of that story. It just happens organically, doesn't it? And you yeah. don't, you can't yeah. be constrained. It used, used to happen, you, but now that's that's all finished, I think. Um, talking talking about your autobiography, I, I really enjoyed some of some of the observations about the the various despots and warlords that you <laughs> either interviewed or you were certainly trying to get an interview with them. There, there's there's a, a very wry story about Colonel Gaddafi <laughs> when you, you think that you've got this really exciting scoop about him sending the alleged Lockerbie bombers back to the UK. You're really excited. You're, you're, you're doing this uh, interview with him in his tent in the desert. And then the cameraman tells you afterwards that there's a bit of a problem. Do you want to, do you want to tell everyone? <laughs> Well, yes, I mean, the, I, want to, I want to know, were you so wrapped up in the interview that you didn't hear what was going on? No, I, it, the it, it thing, layers, and it sorts of it brings the comedy, doesn't it, into into hard news and, and the reality that that everybody's human. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, I mean, Gaddafi was just farting the whole time, but I couldn't hear it because for security's sake, they wouldn't let me uh, within about, I must have been about 10 yards away or something and uh, from him. I did notice that he was kind of rising up out of his seat and then sinking back with a little kind of smile of self-congratulation every, um, pretty much continually actually. And um, so, yeah, it rather, it rather wrecked it to know that he was, that he was farting. I didn't know how to, say that on the BBC. I've never, <laughs> I've never heard anybody say it before. And so I, I didn't, I didn't, I allowed the sounds to come through and you could see perfectly well what he was doing. And I forget, I used some expression saying, he, you know, he was, I don't know, he was uh, kind of, um, you know, fairly natural or something, or he didn't hold back. I can't remember what I, what I said, but in um. Of course, in the, I wrote a newspaper article about it. And of course, you know, when you write about these things in the newspaper, it's much easier to do that. So I said that he broke wind continuously for 40 minutes and um, almost continuously. And the editor, uh, the editor himself, a good friend of mine, put a, a, a headline on the, on the story that said, warm wind of compromise blows from Gaddafi. Well, that's, very, that's was, a lovely, elegant broadsheet. Lovely, yes. A lot yeah. of fun, fun with, with headlines. Now, um, another fascinating encounter um, was with Fidel Castro. And um, I, I think what's fascinating is, you know, you, you're reporting often in, in war zones, in, in very dangerous situations about conflict and coups and insurrections. But at the end of the day, the, these people who are leading these revolutions are, are human beings. And when you doorstepped Fidel Castro, you know, he, he started to talk about the fact that he was bored yes. with running Cuba. And yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating to, to hear these people being honest, really. About well, you see, the thing is- The side of life, because, you know, I mean, I can remember every uh, student friend that I had at university having a poster of Castro, you know, yeah. poster boy for for being a rebel uh, as a student, and it, it's interesting to to just see the the, the human side of, of somebody, and the fact that perhaps they've bitten off more they can chew, which goes goes back to Gaddafi as well, who wrote some very depressing poetry, didn't he? Which he had Awful, and absolutely dreadful, and and um, suicidal short stories, um, which I've got downstairs somewhere. He signed it to me, um, both his poems and his insane um, um, political philosophy stuff. But um, with a man like Castro, see if you're if you are absolutely unchallenged, um, you can do and say what you want, and so uh, uh, somebody who's elected somebody who's got to watch out for his political position um can say 
uh, has to be extremely careful about what they say. And they've got to remember that all the time they're speaking to their voters, they're speaking to their supporters and so on, and they're speaking to the kind of their rivals who want to take over from them. If you're president for life, as, as Castro was, you don't care what you say or what you do. So he, yeah, he said, I mean, he, he was the one that used to make seven hour speeches um, and the, of course, the dreadful thing was that, you know, if you fell asleep, um, you were really in 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 trouble. Um, Did you ever and, fall asleep in one? You know, while you were hanging around? Well, I never had to listen to a seven-hour thing, fortunately. But you know, normally when you stop a politician and uh, I ask him or her a question on camera. Uh, you get an answer that lasts for maybe 15, 20, 30 seconds. Um, and then you can maybe even ask a follow-up. With Castro, uh, it was a boiling hot day, and I had a really um, tough, strong, but very big cameraman, a wonderful South African guy, friend of mine. And um, he... Uh, he was all fine, you know, and I suppose he assumed, as I did, that Castro would answer something in, in 30, 40 seconds. Uh, it was 30 minutes, I think. I asked him a question and he just went on and on and on and on. And at one stage, I remember about 20 minutes in, the, camera, the cameraman looked at me and he whispered, is this fucker never going to stop talking? And during this, he said, yeah, he said, oh, I'm, I'm so bored. There's nothing to do. Um, I think I'll throw the job up in, in a couple of years' time and I'll just go and retire somewhere. Of course, none of it was true. He didn't do that. A couple of the years passed and he was still, still there, still making his seven-hour speeches. And maybe if anybody was able to catch him, um, still giving 40-minute answers to a single question in the street. Yeah, you're, you're right about, I mean, uh, any elected politician is much more like the characters that we see in something like House of Cards. I mean, I, I've mm. always loved the, the statement, you might possibly think that, but I couldn't possibly <laughs> say. And, I, you know, I've interviewed one or two pol politicians for softer features. Um, one of them was Harriet Harman. And I was astonished at how she spent the whole interview not telling me anything <laughs> and saying that she would have to take advice before answering what was a fairly soft interview question. She, she wouldn't answer any of it. <laughs> she, her sister was more fun. Her sister was a human rights lawyer. <laughs> she, was, she was great fun, but it, it was frustrating. But the thing is, you see, you know, when you do these things, uh, you're just... Uh, a second away from utter disaster. Well, the, that of the possibility, at any rate, that you'll be, um, you know, lobbied and and uh, and and condemned for what you say off on the spur of the moment. That's why these things uh, have become so kind of, of of tedious. You know, it was Margaret Thatcher of all unlikely people who. Um, decided that she was going to allow herself to be doorstepped uh, as prime minister and she was she was pretty good at it um she knew how to throw throw a bone to the journalists you know give them some bit of information that they wanted or some some slogan that they w would would the use way and use yeah. yeah. So they they were she she was the first one. Before her, prime ministers never did that kind of thing. And Tony Blair never did it throughout, I think throughout his entire time in office, 10 years or whatever it was, he never uh, did a, um, a, 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 a a doorstep interview like that for fear, presumably, that he'd say the wrong thing. Yeah, you're you're right. He didn't. I do remember that. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, you know, when you go away, when you've gone away on assign assignments, and the conditions have been very difficult. I mean, it's 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 either feast or famine, isn't it? You're either staying in a palace or you're staying in an absolute flea pit in some hot troubled hotspot in the world. How how do you deal with that? And 
do you like the fact that you know you're coming home to first world comforts? Do you actually like the contrast? Is that part of the attraction? Is there a well, to, you know, you, you've, you've uh, gone in deep into the forest in search of the Ebola virus. Um, you were shipwrecked in the Amazon and you could have very easily been um, eaten by piranha fish <laughs> in, the, in the Amazon. You've done some incredibly dangerous things to get at the story. It doesn't seem to have deterred you. I mean, you must, you must be very tough, John. Have there been times when you thought, well, I've had enough of this? Oh, I've never thought that. I've never, I mean, I've, I've often thought, oh, I'm, I'm sick of this dump where, you know, there's no running water, where you've got to, I remember- um, Your head, you know, on, on the earth, I mean, in the Amazon, having survived the shipwreck, you then just, you were being bitten to death by insects all night <laughs> long, which means you didn't get any sleep. No, well, that, that, that these things and then keep going. In that yes, situation. these things do uh, do happen. I, mean, I remember a friend of mine um, uh, in Angola during the during the civil war there, years and years ago. He got thrown out for saying, uh, writing to his bosses uh, in New York to say, please send bottled water as shaving in coke is really unpleasant and um he was thrown up because the 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 angolan authorities thought this must be some sort of code i mean nobody would ever talk about shaving in in coca-cola so uh, yeah there there are there are lots of times when i uh, you know and i I've, I've thought oh god i can't take this a day longer but i mean the story dictates what you're doing you you um i mean if you you know if you're in i don't know what northern iraq or or, or something like that or in afghanistan in the wilds of afghanistan there isn't any running water much um there's nothing you can do so you, you just got to you know put up with it and thank god uh, you know on television you can't you, you can't smell the person that you're looking at so um uh, that that's uh, that's been quite uh, quite useful really you do you have some creature comforts that you take uh, or have taken on foreign correspondent assignments to to places like iraq and to cuba you know some home comforts that make life bearable and or you know civilized when you're away i know you've smuggled whiskey into into the middle <laughs> east where <laughs> Been completely dry, and you've risked being thrown into jail for that. Yes. And away with it. Well, I, I was. Speak of uh, your pants, clearly. Yeah, I was in the, in a hotel uh, in the Intercontinental Hotel, absolutely disastrously crappy place in Kabul in Afghanistan, and I'd brought in a, a, a bottle of whiskey, a really good sixteen-year-old um, Lafroig single malt which is my favorite and i um i was in in my room and the uh, taliban raided the hotel uh, there were about five western journalists there and they had the idea that we all had booze i don't know maybe somebody um spotted uh, the bottle or something and they came down i heard them coming down the corridor bashing in all the doors and searching the rooms and then, and they came right to the one next door to mine and they kicked the door in there and my nerve snapped. So I, I, I took the bottle of Laphroaig, most wonderful liquid on, on God's earth, and I poured it down the loo. Oh no. And then I heard it was just all gone when I heard one of the guys say, ah, there's nothing here, let's go. And I looked down, I, I promise you, I did think, I wonder if I could, you know, get it back. But then I thought, perhaps, perhaps not. The, the loos in the Intercontinental are famously, or were at any rate, famously awful. So I, I, I didn't. But, um, yeah, so I like, I like those kind of creature comforts. I mean, it's, it's wonderful to pull out a bottle of, of, of whiskey at the end of the day and give it to everybody else. I mean, it's, 
you know, because it, most people don't bring that kind of stuff and it, it, it really cheers the atmosphere. And I like, I like smoking cigars. And so I, I, I kind of like to bring the odd cigar and again, share them out. The, bit. the one thing that irritates me is when people say, oh, I've never smoked a cigar before. I wonder what it's like. And you think, yeah, you're going to take my 25 quid cigar. And after three puffs, you're going to throw it away, which is almost always what happens. But what can you do? How wasteful. Now, th there's a, a lovely aside in, in, uh, in uh, the autobiography again, where you were talking about dressing up to impress warlords, which was a, a fun comment. What, what do you do about your foreign correspondent wardrobe and how do you keep it in decent nick in the most inhospitable places on earth? I always remember you in that wonderful leather jacket, which is obviously <laughs> more forgiving than a suit. Is that why, well, that, is that why you took the jacket? Because <laughs> you know, it would look reasonable in the most difficult situations. Yes, I mean, it, it, it resists most things, not stains, sadly, but, uh, but most of the kind of things, whereas, a, you know, I don't know what, a linen jacket or something, the sort of traditional thing would, would uh, um, look awful like. awful if you couldn't iron it, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, it looks like something you'd wipe the windscreen with, you know. So um, I, what I used to do... It's never pass muster in a Graham Greene novel. It's, it's absolutely <laughs> immaculate. I used to um, get my get the laundry um, to pack up my shirts in a in a little sort of um, plastic bags, you know, and I'd I'd take a bunch of them, and when I was going to be on camera, uh, I'd 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 pull them out and I'd use them, and they look quite kind of of tidy. I once actually was. Uh, made the i think i was the number 34th best dressed man in britain in the <laughs> universe i don't know for, long, that, right? well, well how did you take that Were oh you... well i was of course amazingly <laughs> flattered but it was really it was really this was when uh, in the days when i was living and traveling from out of ireland uh, it was really our lovely um uh, lady cleaner there that uh, who did the shirt so beautifully and um, so I mean she she should have got the the prize not me. Now I, I also know you're quite particular about your shoes aren't you that shoes a good pair of brogues are important uh, particularly in a war zone you know in case the, the bullets and bombs are going off they Where they are you get and shoes. Are you very particular about your? Um, well, in the days when I when I had money, I yeah, I I used to get uh, really good shoes. Now, of course, I benefit from that because uh, that my brogues are often you know 20, 25 years old, and they're they're fine. I mean, they're still absolutely fine with uh, commando soles. I always had to have commando soles because otherwise you know the leather soles simply can't take the punishment um and uh, yeah i i've uh, i i use them I, it's so important to have the right shoes if you don't have decent shoes you can't walk and who knows how far you may need to walk in a day i mean nowadays even now in these much reduced times i take the dog for a six mile walk every day wow. and um you know if you if you go in 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 trainers or something uh your feet would fall apart no end now i i would love to talk to you about ageism i mean you, you know you are at the point where i'm sure if you wanted to you could retire and you could just have fun writing more books writing more novels, writing more uh, memoirs, you know, because you, you've had so many experiences, you, you have an, enough experiences to keep you writing for the rest of your life. What makes you carry on being BBC World Affairs Editor? Why do you do it when you could rest on your laurels? Well, I have to say- Is it, it, is is it is impossible to, to stop? Do you hate the idea? No, no, not really, but it it's, um... And it's, but it is extremely difficult to keep on peddling. I mean, I, I, I really have to um, 
convince people, A, that I'm up to the job still, and B, that um, there might be some unfortunate uh, uh, consequences of sacking me simply because of my age. Um, I've kind of left quite a few heavy hints around about, about that. Uh, the reason, there's two reasons really. Um, I've got a young son, he's now 15. That, and, that's, that's Rafe, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Rafe. And I, I, I want him to feel that, that his dad um, is somebody still, you know, who, who kind of, who kind of does things and not just sitting around. And is full of energy and, and understand. Yeah, and uh, not, no, not just sort of sitting around reading and complaining and saying, keep that music down, you call that music, you know, and all that kind of stuff like that. So that's one thing. Um, and the other thing, yes, I mean, it, it is, of course, great fun. I don't, I don't feel quite ready. I'm 76 Am I 76 or 77? No, I'm 76 at the moment. And I don't, I don't feel um I don't feel like throwing it up at the moment. It's still I don't, I I don't, don't think we should have to. And the problem is, I, I do think there, there's appalling ageism in journalism. I think it affects women very badly. Mm. I mean, it starts, you know, once you get to 35, 40, you you have to lie about your age. Mm. You shouldn't have to, but you know, it's it's not just a young person's game because being a great journalist takes a lot of experience. It's experience, it's doing it for a long time and it's practice. You can't just suddenly be great. It comes with track record. And I think it's very important that young journalists work with older journalists to soak all that up, you know, that knowledge and experience needs to be passed on. And if you kick all the older journalists out, then there's an enormous vacuum. Do you think that that also applies to the, the BBC? I just think there's always this excitement about youth, but in journalism, it's very important to have really experienced people in a newsroom or on a magazine. You need to have all the age ranges represented. Yeah, I think so. Um... But you mustn't allow the 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 oldies to kind of of uh, take over the whole the yeah, whole show. Yeah. And of course, you know, I mean, I I'm I'm the the sort of oldest of the lot, I think. Um, so I mean, it is fairly natural that I should uh, perhaps move on. I just think that there's something that I can do, which, um, you know, people, other people can't so easily do. I mean, I, it's, you know, I, my memory of reporting goes back to the days of, uh, of um, uh, John F. Kennedy before he was, he was shot. And That's um, like, I mean, your depth of experience, the, the events, the, mo the momentous events that you've covered is invaluable. I mean, I'm sure, do you do you ever mentor younger colleagues because they can learn so much from from what you've experienced and what you've done? I mean, I I'm I talk to groups of journalists a lot. Um, I really do, but I, I I don't know that anybody would want to have me around telling them you know precisely where they've gone wrong or or I whatever. So I'd rather avoid it. Stories about you know what it was like to cover. Kennedy or Castro, I, I think that's exciting. I yes, think I mean, you're coming up now, you know, you should be excited about the events of the past 50 years. It's well, I, I feel so, but it is amazing how people don't even know what what happened. I mean, that's always been well, true. Well, that's true too, but you know, that's really not good enough. If you're a journalist and you want to be in news, you should know about the history. Yes. Well, yes. I, I remember when I was a, a Brussels correspondent, uh, some poor chap on Reuters got into terrible trouble because he said um, he read, there was some, you know, one of these incredibly boring uh, standoffs between, in, in this case, Germany and Britain about, I think it was about potatoes. Um, so, you know, really, really yawn making. But so in order to try to put a bit of spice into this, the chap said, 
um, uh, uh, Britain's relations with Germany reach an all-time low today over the issue of, and somebody had to point out to him that, you know, they weren't terribly good on the kind of first day of the Somme or D-Day or something. Um, and, uh, but I, you know, you sympathize with, with the, the young bloke who does that, but um, I thought that was really quite good. Let's, let's talk about books and movies. And one of the things that delighted me about your autobiography was that you make references to movies. And I, I write a lot about film and, mm. and actors. And there, there's a very, I think, there's a sort of gallantry about your, your, um, your journalism and some of the things you've seen in awful situations. So I'm thinking of the... Um, the chapter in the book where you're in uh, at the siege of Sarajevo and you meet this really beautiful woman who uh, whose husband was murdered. She's called Yasmina. And um, she comes to you for advice. She's desperate to get out of Sarajevo. She's a, now a widow with two young sons. And she tells you that she's found a way to get out. And that is by handing over money to a corrupt UN official and she also has to sleep with him if she wants to get her and her kids out and you um, referred to a scene in Casablanca do you want to tell us about that oh uh, yes Claude, where um uh, what's his name the, the Claude Rains Claude Rains Claude Rains but what's the name of the character I can't remember yes um, where that's right. Well, he's in that the commissioner, that isn't he? Situation. Yes. I mean, I don't want to. I I don't want to diminish the awfulness of that of that woman's experience. I mean, that really was so so shocking. Um, but uh, it did remind me of 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 Claude Rains. Um, that intimate somebody... scene where, yeah. I mean, let, let's tell the the audience a bit of, about it. He is using his position. To, um, to basically get vulnerable women who want to get out of Casablanca um, in return for a safe passage, they have to agree to sleep with him and money is exchanged too. And, and it sums up the desperation, doesn't it? In a war yes. situation where people will do anything. It's, yes. And there are always awful people who will exploit that. Of so, course, in, in um, Casablanca, uh, you know, because of the mores of the time and so forth, um, that was all, it was all implicit, but it wasn't explicit. And all that happens, all that you actually see is that um, somebody, uh, the, one of the lower officials comes in and he says, uh, excuse me, uh, mon capitaine, but uh, there's a, a lady seeking for a, looking for a visa. And he, Claude Rains looks in the mirror and he does his part. Yeah. 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 And but the thing is that that Humphrey Bogart's character um, gets her out of that situation. He's he's chivalrous in a steely, pragmatic way, but he saves her from that. Phase. Well, I wasn't able to save this uh, this no, particular no. woman, and in fact, um, I think she went through with the whole with the whole thing. I mean, I was just you appalled. You tried to make sure that she wasn't double-crossed because, I mean, it was an awful yeah. situation. Well, I could do that, and, and she wasn't, and they did uh, they did get her out. But, I mean, it was a very, very disgusting um, episode, really. Hard to hard to love any, any organisation which has people in it that do that kind of thing. Yeah, that it's shocking, but it's not surprising, isn't it? There will always be someone who is quite happy to exploit um, their fellow human beings in a in a really desperate situation like that. But mm. on a lighter note, um, if you had to pick one movie that sort of sums up the, in a way, the kind of life that you have lived, it, it could be a film of, about journalism. Wh which one would you pick? Uh, well, I never think the films about journalism are really like journalism. No, the film I'd take with me, and I, I always do take it with me, one of the many that I take around is Duck Soup by the Marx Brothers. 
<laughs> because it's got all that kind of ludicrous uh, side of of of, of journalism. That the, the, there are spies in it. They're not. I think the, most of the Marx Brothers become spies at one time or another in in Duck Soup, and uh, there's just some lovely, lovely scenes which. Every time I watch it, I must watch it every kind of couple of years or so, and it has me rocking with laughter. I, so that's that's what I'd take because I think you have to have a sense of the ludicrousness of 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 these scenes. If you get too deep and too serious, then um, I think you start to crack up a bit. Actually, well, sure. I, I, one film that I like, uh, which features uh, a journalist. Um, is um, The Quiet American with an mm. absolutely brilliant performance by Michael Caine. Is, is that a film that you like? I mean, it, it does show, um, it shows the cold hearted pragmatism, I guess, of the, the Michael Caine character. But then, you know, there he's, he lands up um, fighting for a woman, doesn't he? You mm. know, it's not just about war, it's about love and war. Mm. And he shows his his ruthless side, but I felt that it it painted an, an accurate portrait of what it's like to be a journalist hanging around trying to find out what the story is. You know, as you talked about earlier, going out and looking for it. Mm. It's, yeah. it's it's very atmospheric. Is is that a it film is. That yes. you enjoyed? Yes, 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 and I like the previous. Um, uh, the earlier um, v- version of, of it too. Um, I, but I still prefer the book. Um, but then, you know, at the other end of the scale, you've got films like um, His Girl Friday with Cary mm. Grant, which is absolutely hilarious. But again, it, it, it always paints us as being ruthless, doesn't it? That we'll do anything for a story. It, go- it goes back to what you were saying earlier, uh, you know, that journalists generally are considered slightly disreputable, even if we're working for a broadsheet, you know, we're lumped with estate agents. We're not. Mm, quite right, too. <laughs> do, I've you gone, think, do you um, think so? Well, I don't think, I, I, you know, I think if you start to see yourself as some kind of uh, political balance giver, you're, um, I think that's the way to madness, actually. There's a wonderful scene in, uh, in uh, His Girl Friday, which absolutely typifies journalism for me, when there's this character who's uh, just about to leave the business and go off with this charming young girl, and um, he's tapping away, he's writing his story, and uh, uh, he's so deep in it. And she bangs on the door and she's, I forget what her name is, you know, uh, this is this is Ethel here. And uh, and he's banging away and he's so deep in the story, he forgets, you know, he just says, who, Ethel who? And yeah. I, I mean, that that really symbolizes absolutely everything oh. in my existence. You, you know, you become so fixated on the story that you forget all the, proper things that you ought to know about, about your family and your kids and your wife's birthday and everything. It all goes out of the window. Uh, in know, favor it, of the... You know, the, the, the other thing is that, I mean, certainly if I'm working on a feature, I completely lose sense of all time. Mm. I've been told off, you know, for, for not stopping work at what is considered to be a normal time, but you can't. If you're a writer and a journalist and you're, getting into your subject matter you can't just stop you've got Mm. to keep going until it's done so that can be tricky with Mm. um partners and boyfriends so they don't understand that it's it's a singular profession in that way you can't you don't have normal hours no Uh, you know when you uh, i'm sure that applies to your writing as well you know you if you're if it's going well you can't just stop it would you know, ruin the flow. Mm. Yes, yes. No, it's a killer for any kind of personal relationship. Now, which is why. Do you have any regrets about you know about the years when you were away a lot as a, a foreign correspondent? I mean, you have you have two older children, two two daughters from your first marriage. You must have spent 
so much time away from home? This is a question I asked Attenborough. Uh, I've, I've interviewed him a number of times and he said to me, he said something quite curious actually. He said, well, it's no different from being a captain of a ship. <laughs> Uh, he didn't really answer, you know, I said, I, he didn't answer the question, really. he avoided it. Um, you know, I said, did your wife and children miss you? Because he, he was away for a long time. I, I don't know, what's the longest period you've been away from your family oh, on a signing Four job? months, four or five months, I think, in, um, in Afghanistan in, in 2001. One, in, one in one stretch you were away yeah. for four to five months and yeah. and also there of course yeah. is the worry that you're doing a very dangerous job you're going to a war zone did, did that cause a, a lot of problems in the past oh yes uh, particularly um I iraq in the after the invasion um there was uh, there was so much violence that even a little kid would probably pick up on on the on the dangers of it. And I remember once my son was about two and a half, I suppose. Um, and I was I was going to Iraq. I used to go every six weeks, I'd go for two weeks um, to to Iraq. And so it became quite a a, a pattern. And um, I remember poor little so and so um standing uh, inside the front door and putting his arms across the the door so I couldn't I couldn't get out and leave and crying his head off I mean that's that, that is that really quite, very hard yeah Do you feel guilty well no because I mean what else is there to do I I, I mean I feel guilty about some things uh, but I don't feel guilty about even you know, having to earn a living. I mean that's that's what I that's what I did. Uh, it's what I still do. And um, no, you I mean, never just, think it didn't it didn't change when you had your son, where you were worried that if you got an, into an incredibly dangerous situation, you might not see him and your family again. No, um, I mean I, I I wouldn't you know I wouldn't put myself. Uh, in in danger unnecessarily, but then I never I never really have, and uh, you know I'm afraid that's the the in that sense the job really does have to come first. That's interesting because I mean you have been in some extraordinarily dangerous situations. I mean I briefly touched and uh, um, we talked in the trailer about your uh, chance encounter with Osama bin Laden. Did you find the letter, by the way, that, that he wrote to you? I think our, our cleaning lady chucked it some time ago. She's chucked <laughs> almost <laughs> everything that I value. Osama, you know? That would be worth framing. It would probably be worth a lot of money. Yeah. But, well, you know, except except it was all, it was all, it, it was all written in Arabic. I mean, you wouldn't know what it, what it was, it could have been the milk bill, you know. Um, right. But the, the point is, you, you have been in incredibly dangerous situations. There have been numerous times when you could have lost your life. The shipwrecks, the, uh, the dangerous encounters with, with people in, in a war zone where life is cheap, isn't it? You're mm. not, not important. And um, Osama bin Laden it, it tried to have you murdered. And it came down to a democratic vote. <laughs> you were allowed, Five, four. allowed to live. <laughs> do, you, do you not look back over those experiences and think that you did put yourself in danger in a lot of situations, but you just consider it a hazard of the job? I mean, nobody forces you to do those things. No, of course, um, of course not. You have to, course. you know, if, if the story warrants it and if that's what you you have to do then so be it i i it, you know the i i think there was something i read the other day um i can't remember so it was a, somebody talking somebody else in the first world war saying uh, you can't possibly uh it, live your life under these conditions unless you decide that you're a dead man and you've got to you've got to come to terms with that, and then you don't worry about surviving because you're a goner anyway. And 
uh, that's probably, um, and that's a fairly extreme um, kind of way of putting it, but when you cover these really difficult things, uh, you shouldn't, I think, worry all the time about whether you're going to survive because the chances are if you're doing the job properly, you won't. Right. I, I mean, have, have you ever, have you been affected at all by um, reporting in war zones? I mean, a lot of, a lot of journalists who cover war for a long period of time do land up with PTSD. And I wondered if, if you had been affected by that. Has it ever damaged or affected your mental health? You know, seeing such terrible things and, and bearing witness to, to suffering that you can't relieve. That must be hard. Oh, it's appalling. But yeah. I don't know. I, I uh... report what's going on, and you can't make you can't make a difference. You can only get the story out. Hmm. I I, I don't uh, I don't find I don't seem to have suffered. I've suffered lots of things physically. Um, I mean, I'm deaf. And I know I'm, that as a result uh, of the of, and, of, yeah. uh, of what happened in the Middle East. Yes. But um, I, I'm, uh, um, I think, mentally pretty much. I mean, I, of course, I'm a nutter. I mean, that, there's no question about that. But um, I'm, I don't... You admit it, you know, that, that you've done so many dangerous things, you would have to be a bit nutty to go and go in pursuit of drugs barons and the, you know... In yes. the, but the, the thing is, I always, what I always feel about these things is... Um, in, in many, many cases, if, if I didn't do it, uh, the, the BBC wouldn't report on, on, on those things. I mean, there are, of course, there's loads and loads of really, really good and brave correspondents. I don't, I don't mean that. But often with these particular things, um, you know, if I decided to sort of uh, um, step out of the picture, then uh, it, there wouldn't be a, a chance for the BBC to get somebody else in there in time to cover it. And so that, that sense of kind of duty um, does, is quite powerful and it, and it keeps you going. As for the PTSD thing, um, I, I don't, uh, uh, I mean, I, 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 I've, I've had some one or two bad nights and, uh, even nowadays, sometimes I kind of wake up and, uh, you know, there is a, a faces and incidents and so on come come as a flashback. But I mean, nothing, nothing debilitating, nothing that would stop me doing it again, uh, nothing that I need to take a, a pill or, or a, go to see a, a quack about, you know. You seem to have a, an um, extraordinary resilience, and I wondered if, if you, what's the secret of that? Well, I don't know that I do really. I mean, I just think um, that you're endlessly curious and you get enormous satisfaction from what you do. Yeah, well, I certainly do that. I mean, uh, that's without doubt. Um, I get a huge amount of satisfaction from bringing things, but like I was saying earlier, bringing things out into the open. Uh, I did a piece for yesterday's news. I mean, of course, stuck here uh, uh, in in Oxford or in London, um, but nevertheless, it is still possible to, you know, to get camera crews to interview people. And I, I did a piece which I was really quite pleased about um, about um, how. China is putting economic pressure on Turkey yes, uh, to give up it, its Twitter, yeah. Twitter feed about that. Yes, to give up the its it, it support for the Uyghur minority in in uh, in China, and you know you can do that. I mean, I I, I did that just simply sitting at home, uh, or or spending a, a couple of days in London in the in the studio. I mean it. It, 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 you, you don't have to travel to do some of these things. And I think bringing, bringing out things into the open is, is the only thing, the only excuse really for journalism. I mean, what, what other reason is there if you don't tell people what's really going on in their, in their, in their lives and explain it to them? And 
so you know that that, that that's a, good, a big support i mean if you feel um once in a while that you've done something that you're pleased with and that has told people something they perhaps didn't know already i think that's that's its own justification and i think it does protect you against all these these kind of um you know ptsd kind of flashbacks and so on i think if you have an extraordinary passion for whatever it is you do in life that that can offer a protection to mm. to the possible um side effects and damage that your job can can put you under mm. um one thing i i wanted to to ask you about is you know there's, there's a lot of undermining and criticism of the BB, bbc and some of that is uh coming from government and i do you think the bbc will will survive in its present form um in the short run yes under pressure in the longer run i'm i'm not certain i think the enemy is i think there's two different types of enemy i think there are ideological enemies of the bbc uh, who exist in in government um and and not just this government uh, uh but you know i mean the the worst damage done to the bbc in my lifetime was done uh, by tony blair and and alistair campbell um so there's that kind of there's people that absolutely want to take the BBC down a peg or two. And then beyond that, there's loads and loads of people who kind of blame it for, for what's happened in the world. They blame it for Brexit and they blame it for, um, in, in Scotland, they blame, um, some people blame it for the, the, the vote in 2014 on, on independence and, so it's an easy thing somehow, you know, there's a screen in I most people. On BBC. I mean, no. you know, the other big, big thread is these new commercial giants like Netflix. You know, it, it's commercial forces, isn't it? And the fact that they now have a lot of money. And I know you made a comment about um, David Attenborough um, making a series for Netflix. I mean, he's... Is he freelance? Because when I interviewed him, he he told me that um, he was freelance for the BBC. Mm. And I thought that was extraordinary. Surely he has a contract to make a certain number of programmes. I mean, I, I, to be honest, I don't, I simply don't know. But I mean, he's not. Like honest, he, but... he he talked to me as if he was a fellow freelance and said, you know, you've mm. always got to worry about where the next penny is coming from, which I thought was an extraordinary comment from someone who is clearly an asset to the BBC, but uh, he, he also has the freedom to make programmes for other commercial organisations because I think he's made programmes for Sky as well. Mm -hmm. would, would you not do that? Um, would you not? Well, work, I'm on right? the... You're not, you're on, you have a contract, so you're not allowed to, right? No, I'm on, I'm on, the, I'm on the staff of the BBC, so I can't, I can't really do right. that. Um, <laughs> I mean, but, have you ever been tempted to jump ship? Oh yeah, loads of times. Um, uh, never quite the moment, and until fairly recently, until about 2013, 2014, I was really pretty much the, the kind of cock of the walk. I could do pretty much what I wanted. Um, and so there was no, no kind of uh, a need really to, do it uh, to do anything else. I mean, I'd I'd have a better time at the BBC than I would with any uh, um, commercial outfit. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And now in these latter years, when I've rather you know um, uh, sort of taken a step back, really, in in some ways, um, well, I just you know it doesn't seem to be much point in leaving, really. And I, I told you that I'd been listening to your podcast, which I, I really enjoyed the one on the Amazon. Did you did you actually make it back to the Amazon? Because I know that the trip that you wanted to do was cancelled, which has a lot to do with climate change because they hadn't had rains in the Brazilian Amazon. Did, did you make it back? 
to, to uh, see what had happened to the, the tribes that you had met uh, on your uh, the trip that you described? Yes, uh, no, I haven't, uh, uh, I haven't been, been able to, but mostly because of COVID. But I don't know, you see, I think uh, anybody, if you work for an out, a big outfit, whoever it is, I think they're, they're going to say, look, what, what's this 77-year-old idiot doing? Not um, yet. <laughs> they're not quite. Seven yet. <laughs> um, you, you know, getting into... Well, hang on a moment. Attenborough is, what, 95? Yeah, but he doesn't do much stuff nowadays, and um, he travels the globe still. And yes, well, maybe, maybe. Um, but I mean, if I went back to see those uh, that that tribe, the Ashaninka tribe in in uh, um, on the on that river, um, the Envira River. Oh God, I I mean, I would so love to do it. Uh, but it, it's seven days, it's a seven day journey in an open boat uh, under pretty fierce um, weather conditions. I mean, sometimes sunshine, baking sunshine, but so often storms, electrical storms and so on. Um, uh, that is quite a quite an, an endurance. Uh, it, it's also, it. also magical, isn't it? I, I've been yeah. to the, I've been to the rainforest in Belize. I, I took Daryl Hannah the film star to oh, do yes. a, a story on deforestation and sustainable fashion in the forest. We did mm. a fashion story. And for me, it was like falling into Alice in Wonderland. It was like going down the rabbit hole because the diversity in the rainforest is completely magical. What, what do you remember mm. about seeing the forest in the Amazon? I, I just remember the fluorescent tree frogs this um, sloth-like mammal that was called a kinkajou mm. flinking through the canopy. It, it was amazing. Yes. Amazing. No, no, no. I would, I would so uh, love to do it again. But, I, you know, you couldn't do that for an organisation because the organisation would say, look, you know, there's the, the uh, insurance doesn't exist to uh, to look after you and um, I so they, I, I thought they'd agreed to it. I thought, thought yeah, they, they did agree to it then, but that was pre-COVID. I mean, that was now two years ago, okay. uh, two and a half years ago, and um, I'm I'm pretty certain they wouldn't agree to it now. But I can do it. I I can take the time off. Um, I can, you know, go with a friend of mine, a cameraman friend of mine, and uh, I, that's what I'd, I'd absolutely love to do. What, what do you, what do you remember about the forest in, in the Amazon? I know when you slept by the river, you um, found the next morning that you had been so close to a jaguar that they're incredibly elusive. I didn't get to see one in, in Belize. I was really disappointed. But they are very elusive. Well, this this was um, uh, the biggest jaguar in the area, a, a, a female with a cub, and we 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 slept on a uh, the river bank after we'd had to swim. Our boat sank, and we had to kind of swim to the shore. And uh, we made a fire, and we slept around the fire. There were about six of us, I suppose, boatmen and the cameraman and me and uh, translator, and uh, I think six. And um, then at, at 4.30 or five or something in the morning, I, it was impossible to sleep because the insects were just absolutely devouring us. And so I, I got up and it was, there was just enough light to see that there were footprints around us. And I walked down to the river and there you could see the, the jaguar, the mother jaguar's footprints and the cubs' footprints side by side. The mother had, uh, had shown the kid uh, how to swim the, the river, which was very wide. I mean, it was wider than the Thames at, at uh, Waterloo, you know? And um, so you see the, 
the footsteps and then you see our camp and everybody else was still asleep except for the cameraman and me. And you could see the footprints going round and round and round the bodies lying there asleep and then going back again to the river. I, I'm rather, I, I do, no, of course, I wish I'd woken up and seen it, but I would have been terrified absolutely out of my wits by it. Well, that's definitely one of your 900 lives, isn't it? <laughs> I've, I worked it out that there are, I, are there, there are 10 times in my life where I've, I've really come within a, a touch of, of, <laughs> of being killed. That's not one of them, actually, because there's no guarantee. I, you know, the Jaguar might well have bolted off with its cub rather than uh, gone for us. Um, but this is, you know, things where bullets sort of either hit or went close some bombs went right off beside me and so on 10 times so i've you know outlived a cat yeah you've definitely outlived a cat and it's been absolutely fascinating to to talk to you uh, about your life today john i think now we're going to ask um our invited guests if any of them would like to ask you a question Okay, well, thank you. And thanks very much for your question. It's been really, really enjoyable, John. Rachel, do we have any questions? Rachel? Hello, sorry. Uh, we don't have any questions yet, but we're, we will hope for some. If anyone's got right. it's, it's, a question uh, there. Have we got a question? Yeah. There's a, a hand. Oh, question. I, it's Jane. It's not Les. I don't know why I've come up as Les today, but um, oh, I, well, it's yeah. good to know that, that. Yes, we wondered who Les was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just wondered um, whether or not you feel that COVID, because um, we've been absolutely saturated with COVID stories, <coughs> heard any good journalistic stories out there in the last year? Ah. Oh. I I don't think there's been enough investigative stuff uh, done about about COVID about in this country or other countries. Um, I mean, in this country, you know, all the stuff about the PPE. There was there was some uh, there was a lot of good reporting, but I it it didn't seem to get to the real heart of what had happened about about PPE, whether there was there was wrongdoing or whatever, and the other thing was the the a track and trace um, uh, disaster, really, and uh, you know why that happened and and how I would really like to know in detail. Yeah. So far, we uh, we we don't know that, and in other countries too. Um, in France, so why the EU was so slow about, about the injections. Um, in South Africa, for instance, uh, I mean, there's been huge corruption. I know this because of South African friends of mine telling me, but I haven't really seen it reported properly. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, the, it's, it's like kind of, uh, it's, it's like when the waves come crashing in, you're so, busy keeping your head above water and just trying to kind of deal with the moment that it, it's quite hard to look back take us take a clear look back and see what's gone wrong and why it's gone wrong and who's responsible thank you anyone else like to ask a question yes so, me fran <laughs> okay Fran, go, go ahead and, and ask John. Thank you. Well, it, it's interesting, John, because the question I was going to ask you was actually asked by Alison, and I think I have the answer, but um, it was that listening to you talking, I would imagine you are naturally a very empathetic person. Um, so it was the question around how you think you've managed to cope with the sheer human misery that you've come face to face with and how you've been able to perhaps compartmentalize that and I think listening to your answer there I think it's your resilience which is partly down to that natural sort of joyous 
optimism and for, for life that you have, um, which has possibly saved you from suffering any um, uh, high anxiety about particular incidents or any PTSD. Um, if I'm well, wrong about that, then... <laughs> no, well, I mean, I just think you're being probably a bit too nice. There is, of course, one other possibility that I'm such a cold-hearted shit, I don't really care about what I... But, I, I mean, I don't feel that. That I really don't for autobiography, that. I know that not to be true. Because <laughs> that isn't really uh, no. true, but, I mean, that is one, that is one fairly um, right. uh, obvious ex explanation. I don't know. I mean, I... Working in Africa, um, I was the BBC correspondent in Southern Africa at the absolute height of apartheid in, in South Africa. And I did a lot of reporting there and in, um, uh, in Zimbabwe. What became Zimbabwe was then still Rhodesia. And uh, I, I was very much the kind of product of my uh, of my background you know that uh, the old sort of stiff upper lip stuff and uh, just um, kind of really um, you know not showing emotions not showing too much um, uh, closeness to other people and so forth and I worked I was the Ireland correspondent uh, during the the really the hardest time of the troubles and then I went to um uh, to Brussels, where, you know, I mean, there is no, no clear sense of any kind of emotion there, reporting there. And then I went uh, to, to Southern Africa. And I found myself dealing on a daily and hourly basis with often really emotional people, not the, not, not the, the white people, but the the black people. Mm -hmm. And I very quickly found that, you know, the old, the stiff upper lip didn't actually work. They, they, they just thought it was coldness and callousness. And I learned, it was quite difficult for me at first. I learned to put my arm around people and to kiss them and to hold on to their hands for long periods of time. I found myself much more emotional than I had been. I found myself crying uh, sometimes when they'd tell me their their stories, and it 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 ch it, it changed me a lot. And um, I, I assume I don't know whether for the better, but it just made me a, a more um, kind of uh, more of a human being, I suppose, than I than I had been, you know, with the, the sort of ramrod stuck up my backside. So going from there to something very much more simplistic and practical, you said that you love to go dog walking now. <laughs> what, other, what other ways do you find to just chill on your home patch? Well, I, I'm a, a, a book collector. And so I'm constantly going through on the, the internet, going through searching out for the kind of books that I, I like and I want. I mean, that really is very kind of nerdy, but uh, I, it's, it's, I sit there downstairs when I'm allowed into the next room, uh, into the downstairs sitting room. I, I sit there and, you know, I look at the books and I, I, they, they, they kind of speak to me in a weird way weird sort of way and and of course being with my hiya, hiya. hiya. being with my son um and my wife and just i'm not sure whether it's legal but i mean we go for long walks in the country and um and take the dog uh i i, I i'm just not quite sure i never looked into it because i didn't want to know that it wasn't uh, allowed and um that's that's been that's wonderful really wonderful and you see yeah. the 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 changes you know i live in oxford so there's there's quite a lot of countryside very close and i i see the the changes almost day by day but certainly week by week yeah. and that that keeps you really strong you know wonderful john can i just say i'm actually at work and this is Barnaby, the young man that I care for. Oh, hello, and Barnaby. Barnaby is very interested in film. Uh -huh. and 
Particularly, he is a fan of. Can you tell? Doctor Who. Doctor Who. Oh yes. So, well. Barnaby, come round here and show John. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, John. We've got to do this. Come round here. Oh my God. <laughs> he has He's his own. To exterminate you. Stand next to him. Yeah. <laughs> How <Yeah>. fantastic! <laughs> my God. Is we it a have... real one? Yes. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> it was. <laughs> oh, okay. How thank lovely. you very much. It was brilliant and lovely to hear you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the question. I, I have a question. Sorry. Can okay. I ask? Yeah. There's is somebody that right? else. Is that, is that all right, Alison? Can I ask? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay? Um, yeah. Uh, hello, John, and, and thank you for um, speaking to me. Um, just curious, what do you think of the way um, the police and the government are now dealing with, albeit citizen journalists or journalists, but journalism as a whole? For example, the event in Bristol. Um, how, what do you think of it? Well, uh, as a as a journalist, um, I, I I mean, I find it absolutely appalling that. Mm. Uh, it, that journalists should be the 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 uh, the, the targets of uh, of police actions, but it, it it's always been like that, and it is. I mean, it's a lot better in this country uh, than it is in lots and lots of other countries. I mean, usually when you go to cover uh, a demonstration like that in uh, where should we say in China. Uh, not that there are demonstrations much in China nowadays, or in 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 Russia, or in loads and loads of other countries, including, I mean, perfectly capitalist countries like Brazil or somewhere. Um, you know that that the cops are going to come for you, perhaps before they come for anybody else. And I, I mean, I British people are always deeply shocked when when I say that. Um, you know, I, I must have been arrested hundreds of times over the years and uh, usually released quite quickly. But um, there's something about standing there beside a cameraman uh, which makes them want to come and, and, and do something to you and silence you. And I was really disappointed, apart from anything else, to see that in Bristol that was, that was the case there because you do hope that the British police will be a little bit above the, the, the ones from, you know, Brazil and Russia. I, I just wondered if perhaps the, the police bill that's been passed now, whether or not, um, unfortunately, some of the police force now feel they have more of, um, if you want a carte blanche, to, to take the law into their own hands, quite literally. Well, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but as I say, even before we, the police bill was uh, even thought about, um, it was like that. I mean, I remember covering the 1967, 1968, I mean, um, um, uh, demonstrations in Grosvenor Square in, in, in London and being absolutely horrified by the, the way that the, the, the police attacked the both the the demonstrators and the uh, and the journalists there mm -hmm. and um, I I just think it's it's one of those it's it's just one of those kind of things that you seem to get everywhere policemen mm -hmm. policemen and police women don't like to see um, journalists filming what they're doing always necessarily mm -hmm. and whether this whether this uh, if it becomes a, a, a if it's actually becomes law whether it'll change things or not mm -hmm. to be honest i i suspect it won't change things very much at all which actually is, is quite reassuring because alison you said earlier um that the history of things is important and that the knowledge uh that people such as you have john is very important and that's right it's quite it's reassured me now that what is going on now, which I find incredibly disturbing, from what you say, it actually is nothing new. Um, that this, this has been it, going on. I'm not yeah. saying it's not disturbing. I, I mean, it, oh yeah, know, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. But it's, but it's, but, but, but it's, 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 it's,
for me to, and obviously the trouble is with citizen journalism, we are now seeing stuff on YouTube and so on that, that normally we wouldn't have seen, the public wouldn't see. Mm. And that obviously is that's, people find that distressing, but from what you say, it's nothing new. So, so we, we shouldn't, as members of the public, we perhaps should not be quite so, um, getting quite so, dis well, we should be disturbed, but saying this isn't necessarily anything new. No, no, that is that is the case. Mm. Uh, it's mm. always been like that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you for you. that. Thank you. Do you have any more questions? Ina? Oh, yes, I was gonna just ask John, and that uh, in his view, does he think uh, mankind is heading in the right or wrong direction at the moment, except with the use of social media? And which developments or trends do you see as going the wrong, in the wrong direction? Well, that's a, what a lovely question. Yes, absolutely. Well, allow me please to rave because it's, uh, it's something that uh, I think about a lot. Um, we've, we're just talking about citizen journalism. That seems to me to be one of the most hopeful and best things that, that I've seen. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, rioting or demonstrations in, uh, in Iran. It's a yes. difficult country for foreign journalists to get to. Uh, I haven't been allowed there since 2009. And, um, uh, and, and there's a lot going on, and there's a lot of pressure within society which comes out onto the streets and so forth. We couldn't cover that um, without citizen journalists, without people who've got the guts to come out with their phones and to, to film what's happening. And that's absolutely magnificent, I think. Um, and it, it, it's, it's revolutionizing our expectations of these things. I mean, in the past, we just would, would think of vast swathes of the world as places where you weren't going to get kind of local street journalism from. Suddenly, we are. But um, I'm, I'm quite a kind of enthusiastic, or at least a quite a, a kind of regular um, figure on, for instance, Twitter. Yeah. Um, but I, I feel it's taken us down a really unpleasant route to all of these, these things where you can just say, you can insult people, you can put out lies about, about what's going on in the world. And it's very hard for, for the people sitting at their, at their computers to know whether they're, see, they, they're watching or reading lies or, or, or the truth or some version of the truth. And it, it seems to me we're going back far beyond the kind of the, the big newspaper era, back to the 18th century or something where, yeah. you know, you could publish anything you wanted and you could say anything you wanted and people didn't have the uh, the ability to, to to check it. And I mean, the BBC, I think, has been quite good about these things. It's got a, a, a big um, fact checking outfit. And so so have lots and lots of other newspapers and television organizations. But um, it, I think it's always, you know, the old business about a lie has gone around the world by the time the truth has got its boots on. That is more true than ever with all of this, because after you've got these things lodged in your mind, you then read a newspaper or see it on the BBC that it isn't true. Too late, you know, it's, it's got into your mind and in the minds of hundreds of thousands. I, I feel that's a real um, backward, backward. Set. And people are so nasty. I mean, what the yeah. hell? What you why? Do you know, why do, they, why do they feel they've got to insult you and shout at you and scream at you? I, God. It's awful. I was going to ask you about cancel culture. I think, I think that's incredibly dangerous. It is, yeah. It's happening all the time. I mean, but you see, when, in a really obnoxious way. Yes, it's like a, an ungovernable Pandora's box on a daily basis. I, I also think we have to be very careful for our mental health, not not to take in too much of it. Mm, mm. It's a no, I think you're right. 
So I think you have to think about who you're following. And, and, and I think, I mean, I always try to be very professional as a journalist and I know you are, but there are people who are not, they are obnoxious and there are journalists who've descended into being obnoxious as well. And, you know, that goes against our code of conduct. We're not supposed to behave like that. Just I wanted to finish, but do you know, like social media and the way I view it, because I've, I've been brought up in two families. Like I'm, I'm, I was born in Zambia and I've been brought up in the UK, so I embrace both cultures. So I understand respect, and I think um, social media has brought down even the breakdown of it. I see a breakdown of families. Yeah. People are more insulin and they don't spend as much time with their own family. They all spend scrolling on the phone. And do you worry about your son being 15 or mm -hmm. do you instill some odd culture in him? Well, I, I mean, he's downstairs <laughs> as I speak. <laughs> Uh, he's uh, he's playing one of these uh, one of these games, which actually I have to say I really enjoy. Except I'm so slow and bad at it that that he won't he won't. Well, he's too polite to not to play with him, but he always has some excuse why he can't because I've you know absolutely hopeless. But I mean, he's shooting people. He must have killed more people than I don't know than you know Adolf Hitler just today. <laughs> Um, and it doesn't stop him being a really sweet and sensitive boy, which he is. But what it means is that he, he doesn't have kind of the kind of friends that, um, well, that I had or, or that my two elder daughters uh, by my first marriage had. Um, because they grew up in the 80s and, and 90s and they used to go out with their mates and they'd they'd hang out and they'd bicycle off and uh, and everything and and you know they'd you you knew what time they would do back and you'd look after them but but they they were looking they were sort of able to uh just organize their lives as they chose now my my kid has got loads of friends at school but this is now the start of the holidays I don't suppose he'll see another uh, another kid of his own age during the entire holidays. He'll talk to them, and he'll be yelling at them and 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 everything down the screen. But he won't actually see them physically with him. And I that is, that is really seems so weird to me. Yeah, I think that's a great shame. Mm. But you can't. I mean, if I went down there and unplugged the thing and. You know, you can't you can't do that to yeah, a kid. Yeah. Um, it's just the it's just the historic moment that we're in somehow, where this is what kids do. Soon, of course, you know they'll do something completely different. But at the moment, uh, they're they're trapped with these hugely exciting and and uh, and um, kind of testing systems that they play on. But at the same time, we've never had more um, problems with mental health in mm. children and teenagers. So what is all this overstimulation doing to them, mm. being on, on mobile devices and checking social media instead of <coughs> larking, getting muddy and, and you know going off for the day with your mates in the summer? Can I, can I tell you a story <laughs> about my, my kid? Uh, when he was, oh, I don't know, about six, uh, he was already, um, uh, no, it must have been eight, I suppose. He was, he was already quite interested in some of these, these kind of games. And, um, you know, they're, they, it's sort of Second World War stuff and, and all that kind of crap. And the BBC made a film of Thomas the Tank Engine, and they invited him and me um, to the... Uh, premiere of this of this film and loads of other BBC people with with young kids, and I could see my kid was um, you know he thought it's it's a bit below him actually Thomas and Tank Engine so right from the start I I went because I knew there was going to be free champagne or something but he you know he thought um, he thought it's a it's a little bit below me. And uh, then we got, uh, there was a, a camera crew going around and somebody came over to him and clearly really irritated him by being patronising and said, do you like Thomas the Tank Engine? 
And my kid said, yeah, I used to, but now I like shooting Nazis. <laughs> and my God, the response around everybody, they thought, what sort of monster father must this kid have you know what sort of brutal kind of killer killer figure um but i mean the interesting thing is that uh it doesn't it doesn't make you harder or a, a nastier person and I've, I've seen studies about this i wouldn't let him do it if i thought that it 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 it, it, it was sort of brutalizing him in in any way it's just a game and it's just a rather exciting game as i say i i rather i don't think when i when i shoot somebody i don't think there's a bloke with his you know he's got a wife and kids at home I, it's just a figure on a screen it's not a it's not real and kids and grown-ups are very able to distinguish between reality and and uh, and fiction and that's what that's what my son does but i i don't know i mean i just think about, it's John, just a, just think about your job does he hmm. want to follow in your footsteps no you're kidding no, he's um, no, he doesn't know what he wants to know, and why should he? You know, I mean, sometimes he thinks he wants to be an archaeologist, and sometimes he thinks he wants to be a uh, an economist. For God's sake, where does that come from? And yeah, uh, you know, and um, uh, or a physicist. He's studying. He's doing well in journalism. No. What does he think of it? I think mean, he thinks it's rather silly, really. <laughs> well. On that note, <laughs> well, thank, thank John. We've had a wonderful afternoon. Yeah. Terrific fun. Well, thank, thank, thank you so much.